You are listening to the Lucha Central Podcast Network. And now, LuchaCentral.com presents Straight Out of the Bodega with King Fat Boy Papo Esco. From the wrestling world of the podcast world, it's Straight Out of the Bodega with your host, the King Fat Boy Papo Esco. You have arrived, pulled up. To straight out of the bodega I'm your master of ceremonies The king fat boy Papo Esco And as always We are gonna take you on a ride A ride through the blocks Back alleys And street corners of the bodega We gonna give you everything you need That's pro wrestling and entertainment I'm ready I hope you're ready So let's get this Memorial Day edition Of straight out of the bodega started Now Unless you've been living under a rock and you don't know what Memorial Day is, it is a great day of remembrance for our nation. It commemorates all the men and women who have died in military service for the United States of America. So on behalf of the podcast, I want to offer our condolences to the families of those men and women who gave their lives for our freedom, gave their lives for our nation. We love you. We salute you. We thank you for your service. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm doing great. I can't complain. There's a lot of good things happening right now. A lot of big ventures that are going on with us. And as it pertains to the podcast, you know, I'd like to announce right now, if you don't already know, I haven't seen on social media that straight out of the bodega, the podcast is now a part of the Lucha Central podcast network we just joined up with the family so we're excited to see where this is going to go we're excited to see what levels this new venture is going to take us and to celebrate the news this week's episode is going to be a great one we have mass republic and lucha central head kevin Klein Rock on the show. We're going to have a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. We're going to get right to it. But before we do, I'm going to take it on over to the very beautiful Denise Salcedo and the Lucha Central News. Hey, everyone. It's Denise Salcedo here in Lucha Central Central with a look at all of the great shows available this week on the Lucha Central Podcast Network, where you can always find each show on its own or subscribe to the Lucha Central Podcast Network for every show in one easy feed. Things this week kick off on Monday, May 18th with the premiere episode of The Mass Cast with Dos Hermanos Lucha. Find out just who these crazy mask collecting brothers are, a breakdown of the types of masks you can collect, and some hints on authenticating ring-worn masks. All this and more on the premiere episode of The Mask Cast. Tuesday brings the debut of another new show, though this one may be familiar to Lucha fans. The Mask, Mats, and Mayhem podcast was essentially the unofficial official podcast of Lucha Underground during the groundbreaking TV series run on the El Rey Network. Now the gang is back together exclusively here on the Lucha Central Podcast Network as they head all the way back to episode one of the show and each week take listeners episode by episode, not only through what went down then, but new perspectives gained by hindsight. Expect guests on the show every now and then as well. Thursday, we've got new episodes of Straight Out of the Bodega with Papo Esco, with special guest Mass Republic President Kevin Kleinrock as they talk his start, XPW, Wrestling Society X, the launch of this very podcast network, and more. For our listeners who prefer podcasts in Espanol, Thursday also brings the latest episode of La Mesa de los Margaros, where you never know who is going to pull up a seat at the table. Fridays are for the Lucha Central Weekly in both English and Spanish. LC Weekly is your one-stop podcast for all the top stories of the week, along with details on what not to miss out in the week to come. 
And finally, next Monday morning, don't miss the debut of The Business of the Business, where listeners will get an inside perspective on what goes into bringing fans officially licensed merchandise of your favorite luchadores and pro wrestlers. Interviews with artists, merch companies, and wrestling executives themselves take you inside the process like never before. Be sure to subscribe and follow all your favorite Lucha Central Network series on your favorite podcast platforms. And please be sure to give a rating and review to help more fans find the shows that you love. For now, this is Denise Salcedo signing off from Lucha Central Central. Have a great week. Welcome back. Welcome back to Straight Out of the Bodega. I am your master of ceremonies, the King Fat Boy Papa Wesco, and as always, my co-host is joining me, Mr. Gabriel Ramirez. How you doing, sir? Papa Wesco, what's up, my brother? How are you today? Man, I'm doing good. Everything is is great. I think uh, I had a good day, and I'm hoping that tomorrow is going to be an even better one. But uh, speaking of today, I, I I'm kind of excited. Uh, oh yeah, I'm I'm a little bit of a fanboy. Uh, a lot of the content that this man has put out, uh, I've become infatuated with, uh, and I'm excited to talk to him. I mean, let's just get the introduction out the way. You know, he's an executive producer, a writer, a director, consultant for numerous ventures, business developer, president of Mass Republic, which produces everything from pay-per-views to multiple clothing lines, multiple properties associated with TV, film, and stage. I'd like to welcome Mr. Kevin Klein Rock. How are you doing? I, I'm doing well, and I have to admit that hearing someone who I am generally afraid of watching uh, do, do their <laughs> do their work uh, admit uh, or say that they're a fanboy, it's, it's, it's flattering. It's a little flattering. No, I hear that. I hear that. Well, I'm glad you're on the show. Um, I'm, I'm excited to get into it. You know, one of the things that I, I, I wanted to uh, ask you in my research is you, you got started pretty young, right? You got started at like 16, 17, somewhere around there. And uh, you got started in the Southern California area, I believe. So I just want to ask you right now, you know, being that young, h- how was it for you getting into the business and, and go ahead and talk about the things that that you experienced and 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 the influences that you had leading up to now that's a long journey but yeah so i i think it was 16 my parents think that might have been a little bit even younger um but i I think it was about 16 um but i uh i i knew when i was just before i turned 13 that i wanted to work in pro wrestling for my career but um i was scrawny I did not like getting hurt, and so I knew that you know doing what you do in the ring was not, was not for me. Uh, and so it was about figuring out what other kind of a career in the industry I could have. And mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, I've told the story before, but like at the time when I was twelve, going, I, I was a late bloomer in terms of becoming a wrestling fan. I didn't really become a fan until I was probably around eleven, twelve years old. I mean, like when. On the weekends, if I was home and I was flipping channels and it was on in L.A. on the weekends, it was on Fox, um, I'd watch it. And I, I have memories of like getting up at like 536 in the morning and watching NWA or early NWA WCW uh, with my brother um, when I was young. But like I didn't I didn't really know when it was on or, or schedule my life around it. Um, and I didn't have cable growing up, so that was a big part of it. Like, I grew up in a non-cable house, so we had, like, five right. channels. Um, but my best <laughs> friend growing up, he had cable and he had pay-per-view. And his family would order the – back then, you know, it was only, like, WrestleMania. That was it. Maybe, like, maybe back then Survivor Series. and Yeah, I guess Survivor Series and SummerSlam were also going on because I would rent those VHS tapes from, like, the corner – video store um but uh, once i once i turned 13 and it was right after wrestlemania 7 like watching wrestlemania 7 watching warrior versus savage that was where i said this is it like i'm in i'm in i'm all in this is what i'm gonna figure out how to do with my life and i just started doing everything i could to figure out how the hell to get involved in the business so i would read every wrestling magazine and at that time there was like 10 wrestling magazines coming out a month and right. most yeah, newsstands i went to you know, didn't have all of them. Uh, most had like, you know, 
like the the aftermath pro wrestling illustrated and and uh and those but there was a couple like there was a there was a, a newsstand by my grandparents house my grandparents had an apartment in like the like la hollywood area and there was a restaurant that we would go to sometimes we went to visit my grandparents and the newsstand there they had like everything they had like 10 different wrestling magazines so no matter what when we went to my grandparents house my parents asked me where i wanted to eat for dinner I always conveniently had to say the restaurant that was right next to the newsstand because <laughs> I wanted to make sure I could get my hands on the wrestling magazines. Um, and at some point, and I know there's a lot of people who have this same story, but uh, there was an ad in one of the magazines. I think it was, it was the Pro Wrestling Illustrator or something for this book. It said it was. It was more of like this pamphlet uh, called So You Want to Be a Professional Wrestler. And it was by Dennis Brent and Percy Pringle the third, Paul Bear. I still have it somewhere here in my office. Um, and it, it, it had inside like all the stuff, like you know, there's more jobs than just wrestling. There's ticket takers and ring announcers and this and that. And I'm like, all right, all right, we can we can figure out a way to kind of start to work into the business. Um, of what I was going to say before was so not understanding the business, not understanding how it worked. Like I knew that there was something. You know, it wasn't a hundred percent legit, but I didn't know how it worked, and so I wanted to be Jack Tunney. I wanted to be president of the WWF. I wanted to be the guy that made the matches. I knew that's what I wanted to do, <laughs> and in the end, that's kind of—I mean—that's that's what I did. I became a producer and a writer and a booker, but you know, I didn't understand any of those terms or, or roles back then. But in this right. book, uh, it had a list of all the wrestling schools, which. One, it probably wasn't all the wrestling schools, but two, back in 1993 or whatever it was, there was not nearly the amount of wrestling schools, you know, that there are today. It was much more of a, clo- a closed business, you know, even even back then. Um, it was still on. It was still on the tail end of of the business still being closed up to everyone. Yeah, right? it was, so. and and that was my experience because I started. So there was this little wrestling school and uh, and promotion that happened to be just maybe ten minutes from my parents' house uh, in Sun Valley, California, called Slammers Wrestling the, Federation. The Slammers, gym, yeah, Slammers Wrestling Gym, and uh, so I started to go to the shows there, like. They ran that shows, I think it was like the first Sunday of every month. And I dragged my, my mom and my, my mom hates wrestling, but I dragged my mom and my dad and my brother out to the first one. After that, my mom never came again, but my dad would let me go kind of like <laughs> every now and then. And I was probably about 15, maybe four. The first time I went, I was probably 14. And then I kind of went every now and then. Um, and they had this like souvenir program, they called it, which was really just a couple sheets of paper, you know, that got photocopied at kinko's or whatever but it had like ads for their for their videos and it had um uh, yes the results of their last show and here's the card for tonight and i just decided i was gonna send in uh, anonymously a column like from the heel perspective of the results from the show that i just attended and i I sent it in nope did not decide i used like a fake name and i went to the next show and there he had printed my column on the back of the program and at that point in my life that was probably the coolest happiest moment of my life um it was (laughs) you know i was i was like nervous i was excited and so i kept doing that somehow uh, he knew that it was me. He figured out very quickly that it was me. And he asked if I wanted to be their timekeeper. So I started to be the timekeeper, ringing the bell. And I literally taken time on a stopwatch because it was very old school there. And you, we had time. Um, and then one day the ring announcer no showed. And suddenly I went from timekeeper to ring announcer. And I was doing the ring mm-hmm. announcing thing for a while. And, but uh, it, again, this was, this was 1995 probably. And the business was still very closed. And I just wanted to learn everything I could. And because it was still closed, I was still completely kayfabed about everything. So the Slammers basically has just like so many wrestling schools, just like APW gym was, you know, you have this industrial area, uh, kind of, you know, bay door arena in the back and then there's a little bit of office space up in the front slammers was actually much smaller than the apw garage um but i had to stay in the front in the office when they did everything right. to prepare <laughs> for their shows i was like i I, wow. I was not in on <laughs> any of it uh and i knew you know that it if i was going to actually make a career out of this i had to figure out how to move work with some other people learn some more and 
my senior year of high school, um, you know, Slammers was always doing these like, hey, you know, if you want us to come out to your high school or your, your event or this or that and do a fundraiser, um, you know, we'll come out and put on a show. That's right. You actually did. I did. That, right? I, for your yep, high yep. school. Uh, I was a student body treasurer in my senior year, and I was like, hey, guys, I know how we can make money for the school. Let's put on a wrestling show. <laughs> and uh, it kind of sucked because I went to a school where everybody was bussed in. There was, like, no local students. And it didn't really take into account that you can't really have a great after-school wrestling show when everyone's bussed in. And so we had very few people there. But uh, this was probably not very legal at the time because I was a student at the school, but I got a 10% kickback from ticket sales. Oh, and I, and that was where I made my very first, uh, money in pro wrestling, which was a check for $3 and some odd cents, which I still have somewhere. I never cashed. Um, well, that's the average, uh, that's the average people make now. Right. In independent shows. <laughs> average a long way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and then I was, I was going off to college, um, I was still, I was going to college, I was going to go to college in LA, but I just kind of took that as my time to, you know, I, I was very appreciative that Vern Langdon, uh, who was the founder and owner of the Slammers, um, you know, let me get my foot in the door there. And, and I, I would have never had the career that I had if I hadn't started there, if I hadn't met Dynamite D there, if I hadn't, uh, because, you know, everything's kind of parlays into the next thing. But I just yeah. told him, you know what, um, I'm going to go, I'm going to be focusing on college. I'm just going to kind of step away from wrestling for now and kind of took my, my exit of slammers and, uh, just kind of started looking for other opportunities and ways to get more educated about the business. Um, right. And during, during that time, uh, or I would say shortly thereafter, you, you started, you, you try to start your own wrestling company, right? Yeah. So, uh, so it, there, what happened with Slammers was that there was basically a rift between two different sides of Slammers. Um, Vern, being very, <laughs> being very old school, uh, you know, he wanted to run shows every single Thursday in Bakersfield. And that's about a 90 minute drive from the San Fernando Valley where most people lived or where Slammers was. Uh, and it didn't matter what Thursday it was. It could be Thanksgiving. It could be Christmas. It could be New Year's. He didn't want guys taking time off of their birthdays or the birthdays of loved ones. And no one was actually making money being a Slammers wrestler. But that was, you know, that was that old school mentality of how you were going to, yeah. you were going to learn and respect the business, you know, and, and there just kind of got to be a little riff between people that, didn't want to do things that way and people that were cool doing things that way also too like um ironically this would come up later in, in the xpw days but Vern didn't want people wrestling for other people and it wasn't that there was a huge amount of opportunity back then in the indie scene in los angeles but you know every now and then it's funny because dark side of the ring you know uh, a couple weeks ago herb abrams but herb abrams was running shows and guys wanted to go work for herb and they were told nope can't do that um and so th- there was just this rift and uh, on one side of the rift was dynamite d and a number of the other wrestlers and they decided basically that they were going to do this shoot angle based off of the NWO that was the DWO and the Dynamite World Order. And and the way that I was always told the story, which later Vern told me was not the case, but the way I was always told the story was that D figured, all right, let's do this shoot angle. Worst thing that's going to happen, Vern's going to ignore it. Best thing that's going to happen is that he's going to say, this is cool. Well, yeah, let's just, let's run with it. Let's do an angle. Let's do something, you know, fun with this or whatever. Well, the night that that angle went down, I was later told that Vern said, nope, that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. He basically walked away from slammers. What Vern told me later was that wasn't the case and that the locks had been changed on him. And it was a different story than I had been told. He never believed me that I didn't know this. Wow. I didn't know that story, but. Neither here nor there. Uh, what happened was that Dynamite D, Patrick Hernandez, a referee, longtime referee in Southern California, and oh, myself yeah. formed Southern California Championship Wrestling. But I was a college kid with no money out of my pocket to spend on this. So it was really all Patrick and D's money, um, but I was one of the people kind of running it with them. And we were your typical, man, rinky-dink independent, doing shows at boys and girls clubs and, you know, whatever park rec center we could find and drawing, you know, on a good day, 100 people. 
you know, sometimes less. And again, you know, no one was really making money at it, but it was a once a month thing and, and people were enjoying doing it. And, uh, uh, that kind of parlayed into we. I mean, we hustled for our shows. We would always flyer WWE events or whatever it was, and uh, at a WWE event, WWF, I guess at the time, uh, Rob Black ended up with a flyer, and Rob Black at the time was doing business with Paul Heyman, trying to figure out if he was going to become a West Coast promoter for ECW. They he had a business in Brazil that was potentially going to. Uh, do something with ECW in Brazil and he knew about WWF and he knew about WCW and knew about ECW but he didn't even know that there was anything of an independent scene didn't know that there was anyone else in Los Angeles doing pro wrestling um and he called the number on the flyer to talk to whoever to be like, I'm going to start maybe doing something with wrestling uh you're doing wrestling why don't we talk now thankfully Rob never saw an SCCW show because if he had seen an SCCW show, there would have never been an XPW. <laughs> there would have never been a Wrestling Society X. There would not be Mass Republic the way it is today because he would have run in the opposite direction from us. Um, well, shout out to Rob Black <laughs> for not yeah. seeing. Well, an SCCW and here, here's, show. here's a, here's a kind of <laughs> funny part to that. He was supposed to see a show. Uh, he was supposed to come to a show that was going to be at the um, Echo Park Boys and Girls Club. But oh my God. Uh, we got a call that morning that we had to cancel the show because of the threat of gang violence in the area. And it turned out to be the <laughs> probably the luckiest break that we ever got. Because, uh, like I said, if he had seen it, I don't, I don't think he would have ever worked with us. But <laughs> so he, he we had a, this was my this was my second year of college. So this was like going into the summer of 98. And, and this this is when this is when you started. SCW well, so we were, we were running SCCW Black, right? at that point in time, and then right before the summer of '98, Rob called to meet with um, D, and he and and D brought Patrick and myself along, and we sat down with Rob and his business partner, um, uh, and we just kind of we met at a TGI Fridays, <laughs> and we talked wrestling for like hours and hours and hours, and. What did you What did you order that day? I do not. Re- yeah, <laughs> I do not minds remember know. at all. Um, we sat outside. I remember that, and it was Rob, Tom Byron, and Gene Ross who wrote for the magazine AVN, um, and who was a huge wrestling fan, oh, wow. absolutely huge wrestling fan. Um, and we talked, and then you know, over the next few weeks, there was a few conversations, and it basically came down to. We could either continue to do what we were doing on no budget with no hope of getting anywhere, or we could take a risk, uh, you know, a calculated risk with this guy who seemed to have these big, ambitious plans and maybe get a budget behind what we were trying to do and see what what made sense. And again, at this point, the, the name XPW, the concept XPW wasn't even a thing. This was just an initial conversation about doing something wrestling in the LA area. And um, what during that next year between summer of 98 and summer of 99, Rob was still working with Paul, talking with Paul, trying to figure out what, if anything was going to happen. Cause there, there was a chance at one point that, that Rob was going to do West coast promoting for ECW. And we were just going to help him with that. Um, but as time wore on, we kind of explored more and more options. Um, we flew out Sheldon Goldberg, longtime wrestling promoter and and uh, uh, all around kind of great guy uh, to do some consulting right. and kind of kind of smarten Rob up a little bit on the business. Sheldon's actually the one that came up with the name XPW for promotion, but at the time that X was going to be just an X, like the X Factor, like what the TNA X division ended up becoming a wrestling society X where there was no, it wasn't extreme. It was just um, XPW. Um, but when Paul started negotiating with the TNN TV network and trying to you know bring ECW nationally, he wanted to distance himself from Rob because of Rob's connections to the adult entertainment industry. And it literally from Paul's end became Rob who, and that, pissed rob off to no end it was like yeah yeah so i have to ask if that pissed him off 
did, did that have anything to do with the invasion? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, after I know I'm probably I'm yeah I'm probably well, jumping God, ahead, Papa, you I, went from I like chapter <laughs> one to like the end of the I book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like come on, well, so, it's like oh, <laughs> ch- chapter one and you already I, so you <laughs> die. I mean, like, come on, you know, there's a build up now, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Before you go into Papa's question that pretty much ends the whole book for everybody, is in between that time where you're saying that Rob Black was still holding off for um for Polly to, to yep. get back to him. Take it back a little bit before that, and what was your involvement when you actually came to yep. a Jim Morris? Because I remember, you know, you were still doing SCCW, and you were looking to get more into the business, and you contacted Roland, and then Roland goes, I want you to take care of this guy. And I was like, what do you want me to do with him? He goes, make sure he gets here. You know, he's going to be in Santa Cruz. <laughs> okay. And uh, I, I talked to you, and you and your friend were coming down. I talked to you through AOL. <laughs> And uh, I had my free CD, so I had to have to pay too much on my hours. And uh, I talked to you, gave you directions, and then uh, we met briefly at Jim Moore's. And you sat right by the entrance door, and you had note and paper, and you were taking notes on everything. And then you talked to Roland, and I never saw you again. That was like the last I saw of you until like, God, like years and years and, and way past XPW. What what yeah. transpired? Like, what was actually your goal with with you know? Uh, I remember Roland was upset because um, <laughs> I remember we were in the back, and he's upset that you were you kept telling me at a way you were waiting, you were waiting. Now, obviously, now I know why you were waiting because you were waiting for uh, for Rob Black to pull the trigger on something. But he, what what was the whole decision on what what brought you there? Like, what was the yeah. actual? Uh, and again, process? and so first off, now we're we're going back to we're going back to nineteen ninety. Five probably uh, or early ninety six. It was before I graduated college because my best friend uh, Nick was going up to Santa Cruz to tour UC Santa Cruz um, to go to college there, potentially go to college there. And I was like, "Hey, uh, I think I'm going to go and let's stop by, <laughs> let's stop by APW and make the, make this a, make this a thing." <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, so, you know, you decide when you decide where you're going to college, like in the spring of your senior year, and I graduated high school in 96. So this was probably early 96 or late 95. Um, and so, yeah, we, my, I don't remember exactly. I think most likely it was, you know, APW was very buzzworthy. It was, um, it was a super hot group and school i mean we, in in southern in california it was probably there are only two big schools really were billy and jesse empire wrestling and apw up in northern california and in terms of even being i think like a promotion uh the buzz around apw was i think i think it's fair to say hotter than the buzz around let's say empire um and i just i i wanted to go and kind of find out and i'm pretty sure that through, you know, AOL and, and Yahoo message boards and uh, uh, CompuServe and whatever, uh, that, that, you know, that That's right. just like Slammers, uh, APW also put out there, you know, looking to expand territories, looking to promote other places. If you want to get involved in promoting, you know, give us a call. And and. I'm guessing that's where the the impetus to meet came from because in the end that's kind of what happened. But um, I don't remember much about the trip. I remember going to a buffet with uh, with Roland. We went to a buffet somewhere near the office. Um, it was oh, hometown yeah, buffet. Nice, nice. Oh, hometown absolutely buffet. hometown buffet. That was Roland's go-to uh, uh, right. Shout and, out to and, the and, and can we, let's 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 buffet. let's uh, let's pour one out right now for the fact that buffets may never come back because that's going to be really sad if. Uh, <laughs> We'll get into that later. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So I and I, so I remember you know being at the show. I don't remember taking notes. I remember you know coming there and kind of meeting people. Um, I always. I mean, I always took notes. So there was. I remember going to an Empire show, probably around that same time. Uh, showing up in like a full suit and tie and having people kind of laugh and snicker at me because who's this kid that's like showing up at this indie show in a suit and tie taking notes and stuff. But, you know, I, I learned, I learned be respectful, you know, dress nicely, uh, take notes and, and, and really show that you're interested. And that's, that's what I was trying to do. Um, later I would learn that 
Now, is that now is that something you learned um, common sense on your own, or is that something you were uh, you were taught when you first broke in um, in Slammers? Because your story on on your breaking in with Slammers and what transpired from there is just about almost same as mine and almost everyone who breaks into to independent wrestling right place at the right time. You know, um, did you ever talk to him and find out why he brought you in? Like, why did he let you in to that other side of the curtain? Because even though we were on the tail end of the internet exposing wrestling for, for in, in different lights that we had never seen before, what did he personally tell you what allowed him to say, you know what, let's bring this kid on board because it's your story is no different than mine. You know, Roland took a liking to me and it sounds like he took a liking to you um, for slammers. What, what did he tell you? Like what let him, you know, to say, come on, Kevin, let's, yeah, th- let's get on here. You know, let's, I think let's it was this. probably the fact that there was this 14 year old kid that just, had, you know, it was very easy to see my passion. I was willing to do, yep. you know, whatever, um, and once once he let me in, you know, I was I was typing up the ring cards. I was running to Kinko's and making those programs. I was, you know, and 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 not in a oh let's take advantage of the young guy kind of way, but in a I just wanted to do whatever I could do. Um, and I was I loved it. I just I I it was such a great opportunity for me. And I just think you know it, it's. I think it's that sometimes people like that idea of having an apprentice, you know, and keeping, keeping the, the true trade secrets to themselves for a while. But, um, you know, and I, I have yeah. no doubt that by the way, back, I don't, I think that if I had continued and stayed there and grown older there, eventually, you know, he would have started to let me in a little bit more. Um, but I, you know, I can't say for sure. Um, uh, but and and so I think yeah we never I mean we never I mean we may have talked about it but again now we're talking decades and decades ago and I don't remember um, I just yeah I think that I I look I, I think a lot of my career uh, even today it's based on going out putting in the sweat equity putting in the work and not just expecting anything to be handed to you and I think that the most successful people I mean listen look at yourself you know you've built. PWR, you built Pro Wrestling Revolution. Nobody handed you any of that. Yeah, people helped you learn yeah. things along the way, but in the end, you know, it's your own sweat, your own money, your own investment, your family. And I think, you know, that's what, not to get sidetracked here, but man, it gets, it just annoys me to no end when I see people complaining about not being given an opportunity. And there's no evidence that they've done anything to, to put in the work to get that opportunity, you know? Because the business has changed though. Think about it. And we talk about this all the time with almost every guest that the business has changed because when you broke in, it was still some form of a wall, right? There was still some of that behind the curtain, you know, the kayfabe and all that right now. I mean, the kayfabe is on a whole different level where you can't even tell, you know, who's what right everyone's allowed in everyone's a promoter everyone's a booker everyone's everything because the the social media platform has yep. given everyone a soapbox to be a, a owner president booker whatever so of course people are going to complain because they, they they haven't had the opportunity one to work for it and then they have the soapbox to complain about it think about someone who's complaining now but not, get, not getting a break and so on where they would be when yeah. we came well, no, and I, th- I, I say this all the time. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Were you saying something, Papa? No, 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 no. I I was just, I'm taking it all. Papa, take <laughs> notes. Papa, just know, take so notes and just... I'm taking okay. notes. I, I think, but I think that, honestly, I think that, like, from... from And I've talked with Gabe about this a lot, man. I mean, I, I have an old school training, I feel. And there, there's two things. You know, it's always respect. I don't feel entitled mm-hmm. and take a chance on yourself and and the both of you took chances on yourself you know like like you said you didn't have a lot of like people that would like take you under their wing and really help you i mean you had people along the way that gave you the training and the experience and 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 the wherewithal but after it all was said and done you really had to take a chance on yourself a lot of these kids don't do that they just want the entitlement they want to be handed 
yeah. what they think they should be uh, handed. So, so. Uh, to that end, oh. you know, I, I, th- I was having this conversation with somebody not that long ago. I think it, it, it was uh, it, it's a conversation I had recently um, with uh, the Spotlight series guys. Um, but, you know, back in our day, <laughs> to put the Gabe's day, back in those APW Slammers days, <laughs> you know, if, if Mike Modest uh, or, or uh, um, you know, uh, one of the other guys from up there, uh, wanted to get booked. They put together a package that had a VHS tape, an eight by ten, a resume. Yes, sir. They tracked down who to send mm-hmm. it to. They had to spend the money to make the VHS dub, to get the eight by ten, to do all this, and then put it in the mail, and then wait and wait and wait and hope that someone was going to give them a call. So it pisses me off to no end when I reach out to a talent or somebody reaches out to a talent and says, hey, can you send me your information? And they say, look me up on YouTube or my stuff's on YouTube or check out my Facebook page. And I'm like, you lazy son of a gun. If you as a talent these days do not have an email in your drafts ready to go that has a full match, a highlight reel, a promo, <laughs> a uh, your photos, your all your information, all that ready to go. High res photos, photos that you've got permission from photographers to use to give other people to put on posters. There is no excuse. There is no excuse. And I think about what those workers of the '90s and all the decades before had to do to get work. And it, I mean, man, I just I cannot believe how simple it is these days to really try now listen it might be harder for people to get work in the end you got to be a lot better (laughs) these days a lot to get booked on shows necessarily but on the flip of that too there are a thousand independents out there right now and and a lot of them you know can use new good talent and yeah you got to make those sacrifices and you got to you know put in the work and you know maybe you got to you know help trans yourself in the first time and maybe you got that's a whole separate conversation for another time about you know (laughs) entitlement or what people feel are paying their dues or not paying their dues or whatever but right you know uh it's just it's a it's a whole different world um to jump back to that apw question that we got way sidetracked off of eventually uh, after the Slammers years, before the XPW years, so it was probably around 90, it was my first year of college, I think. So it was 96, 97. Uh, um, Rowan wanted to run a show in Southern California. Rowan, God rest his soul, had no clue about Southern California geography because the show that he booked was in San Bernardino, which for anyone that knows Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley, and San Bernardino, it's like, more than an hour away and I was going to college. There was no way that I was going to be able to effectively on the ground promote a show that was more than an hour away um, from me. But he said, yeah, I want, I want you to work on this. Um, I don't, I don't remember the name of the guy, but there was another guy who was involved with getting that show booked. And uh, we ended up doing the show at the San Bernardino high school, wherever it was. And it was, not that great attendance um and it was what it was no. and that was the first and last time that i really worked with apw um mostly just because there wasn't i i sent out i sent out a ton of inquiries and packages and and flyers about doing fundraising to, to businesses and to schools and all sorts of things and just there was just nobody biting and and those that did bite were just not anywhere near where it would have made sense um, to try to physically promote. So that was uh, my APW experience. And I didn't see Roland until probably 15 plus years later when we did that fateful show at the Cow Palace uh, that the con artist ran about 10 years ago, whatever it was. Um, yeah, about that more- show in San Bernardino was really bad too. It was super empty, man. Um, uh, I remember, um, God, we had uh, two Lucha guys um, that Roland brought in. And one of them, I can't remember his name. He had just finished being on Super Astros. Uh, I think uh, Pantera. I think Pantera Blanca was on that show. Was on there. Pantera, I think, was, yeah. Yeah. And, and we were supposed to have um, his, his opponent. Um, God, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have had to have been Psychosis. I'm wrong. But 
I think it was supposed to be him because instead of him, we got Tempest. Mm. So for those indie guys or those Lucha guys from back in the day, we ended up getting Tempest on that show. And it, Roland was pissed. That's why I hate Lucha. I don't even know if these guys are the real guys under the mask and stuff. And a funny story about that is uh, Ray Sr. was in the crowd. And <laughs> Roland didn't allow him in the locker room. He told me how to leave. Yeah. So <laughs> Mikhail <laughs> sat in the stands, livid as hell, um, until uh, 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 Modest and uh, Max Justice explained to him, like, yeah, I think you kind of kind of fucked up on that one and so they acknowledged them at, at intermission that we had you know the great great mysterio you know in the crowd that Roland kicked him out you know Roland was just pissed because on that show we also used uh jesse building jesse's ring so we had guys like cincinnati red and those guys on the show as well and then all of us made the drive down uh vic grimes max modest uh aaron o'grady we all drove down there and we took this huge trip and we've never been that was our first show we did down there and when we get to san bernardino mm -hmm. it's a ghost town that thing was mm -hmm. empty and so we knew that you know we saw no posters we saw nothing we're like oh we're in for it and it was a beautiful high school great looking place it was awesome just you know yeah nobody there was nobody there and i blame you yeah, Kevin. i blame uh, you for well, Roland, Roland at the time the too. For and that led that led to <laughs> i don't know I've probably told you this story, Gabe. I don't know. So I'm a big believer in using people's negativity to fuel my own my own uh, self. Uh, I you, guess you, talk about that all uh, you know, the time. somebody tells me that I can't Absolutely. do something, it motivates me to do it. Somebody tells me my my whatever my I'm, I'm used to people telling me my products suck, but I'm I'm when someone tells me that my concept on paper isn't going to work, you know, I it just motivates me to do it, but. I remember being in the XPW offices right at the very beginning. And there was a quote from Roland Alexander in, I think it was the observer. It was some, it was the observer, the torch or something that basically said, <laughs> Kevin Kleinrock, uh, isn't even good enough to carry anyone's bags, let alone run a wrestling company or book a wrestling company or something. And I took that and I photocopied it and I highlighted it and I put it on my wall. <laughs> in my office to be like yeah you just wait and see uh i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna make something of this of this company and uh yeah we did uh, you sound like uh you sound like rocky and drago <laughs> rocky four you know it's like oh, no. but it, but xpw though kevin mm -hmm. you, you were vice president right and you also had an an, an on roll an, an on screen role at some point right so talk talk to us about how XPW got started and you know uh take us through the journey leading up to what I wanted to ask as, as Gabe would say the 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 end of the right. story that jumped right Okay well so the I'll try to sum up 6 years of XPW in like a couple minutes um so we started <laughs> XPW uh after you know the Paul and Rob breakup so literally so I was getting antsy I was getting antsy because it had been almost a year of we're going to do something. Maybe we're going to do something. And we hadn't been doing anything. And I'm, I'm getting antsy to just do something in wrestling again. Um, and UIPW, UIPW, I think that's what it was. Uh, Doc Marley oh, wow. and um, uh, Johnny yeah. Hemp uh, and a couple other guys. That was with their group, oh um, like where Samoa Joe broke in even before. Samoa Joe, right? What was uh, no, Samoa, Samoa Joe? Or something like I, that? I don't. I think it was Samoa Joe from day one. Uh, I was there at his his very very first match. Um, uh, that was before you know before yeah. he went off to to UPW and and really that's where he kind of officially broke in, according to legend. Um, yeah. But uh, right. So I literally on my lunch break because I was I was working in the office for Rob. We were basically preparing for this thing that was never actually happening. Um, but we were making plans, essentially. <laughs> um, and on my lunch break, I went to go meet with Doc Marley. And just to be like, hey, man, you know, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to ask Rob if I can at least do some stuff with you guys in the meantime while we're waiting. Because uh, I, I was just antsy to do something again. And literally, after months of nothing happening, I get back to the office from that very lunch. And Rob's like, that's it. We're doing it. 
F Paul Heyman. Not only are we doing XPW, but we're calling it Extreme Pro Wrestling, and we are just going to out ECW, oh, ECW on the West Coast. And we were off to the races. Um, that July, we did our first show, and you know, there's a reason that the very first XPW home video, VHS, never made it to DVD. It's because literally it was like, how do we not just... You know, if ECW was breaking six tables on a show, we were going to break seven. And, uh, you know, a lot of our vignettes were just straight up <laughs> kind of mocking of ECW. And, you know, I think a lot of times because of how XPW started and, you know, in that vein and because of the heat wave incident, which we'll talk about momentarily, Papo, um, you know, people, people had this go. opinion of XPW without actually watching what the product became because it became a darn good product. Um, there was a as, as time went on, it was not all crappy wrestling and blood and guts. Yes. We, we had a King of the death match title and yes, we did extreme crazy matches, but we had a lot of really good wrestling as well. And we had more characters and character development than any other independent wrestling show, I would say, in the history of wrestling up until including today. Um, and I think that, uh, I think that, I think if you Whoa. go back, if you go back now and you watch XPW television, not just the live shows, but you watch the television show, it was cohesive booking. It was, you didn't have these story gaps that you find in WWE these days. Every character was defined, whether it be White Trash Johnny Webb or Homeless Jimmy or, you know, uh, Supreme or Chaos or whoever. I mean, there was very clear characters, clear storylines, and everything built to something. Everything meant something. And I think, you know, when people talk about XPW and the legacy of XPW, I always tell people that, you know, my hope is that someday, and I think now, I mean, even now, but XPW is remembered a lot more fondly by a lot of people now than it was when it died. Um, but my hope is that the the legacy of XPW isn't marred by you know, a lot of the controversy that that uh, was out there, but that it really does get looked at kind of like the B movie version of pro wrestling, right? It was bloodier. It had more, you know, uh, sexual content to it. Uh, it was cheaply produced but it embraced those cheap production values and kind of with like a a wink to them i mean we had a six month period i think it was where we had no live events so we had no actual new wrestling content for the show which ironically is how some shows should probably be right now during this quarantine period but the television product turned uh-huh. into this variety sketch comedy improv vignette driven show that was just all storyline, all character building. And I think it's really some fun, compelling television that I think a lot of people just missed out on. The, the funny part is because we were on the America one network for our syndication, there were fans in the middle of Iowa or North Dakota or Montana that were seeing the show and becoming fans of the show and going to their local video stores and buying the DVDs and buying whatever um, that aren't part of what you would say like the typical internet wrestling fan was because at that was at that point in time we were starting really to get into you know wrestling news sites and message boards and, and things like that um, and so that I mean that was that was XPW and so the heat wave incident which is funny because we just revisited it with um, with Supreme passing away. A couple of days ago, absolutely. Rest in peace, um, to Supreme. Yes, you know, he sir. was he was one of, if not the biggest, uh, homegrown star of XPW. And when when he passed away last week, I was kind of looking for some video clips of him, and I stumbled upon the heat wave incident story that's on the WWE website with sixty million views, uh, which is like all WWE stories there version of history um but it was really a lot more simple than what it was uh, so we were building up to our first anniversary show so so let me take a step back there was like you said before i mean there's hell attention <laughs> between rob black and uh and paul Heyman from the moment we said go uh rob was doing things to poke at him and entice him 
I don't remember if this was before or after Heat Wave, but at one point he took out a full page ad in Wow magazine that was just a letter to Paul Heyman telling him basically to go f himself. Um, and like no what I mean nobody had done that yeah. before. You know, who <laughs> takes out a page in a wrestling magazine that's a, you know at your your enemy essentially. Uh it was just I mean they were he was off the rails at at, at Paul. Um and he loved it, you know. Uh it, it, and we there were other things like when Sabu was getting ready to leave ECW and he needed legal help, Rob helped him with lawyers to try to help him get out of his uh, ECW contract or not get sued by Paul for leaving his ECW contract. There's all these little things behind the scenes that, you know, a lot of people didn't necessarily know about um, that were kind of issues between them uh, as well. But we were getting ready to do our first anniversary show, Go Funk Yourself, with uh, Terry Funk and Sabu headlining at uh at the la sports arena so you know a ginormous venue our biggest venue ever we weren't we knew you know we weren't even setting up the la sports arena to fill the whole thing we were just using the floor but we got this insane deal on rent so it made sense to do it there i think we paid like two grand or something to rent the la sports arena it was some crazy deal that we uh, got because of uh basically a hookup um but so they're they're coming to town right before <laughs> our anniversary, and uh, we decide that. I mean, look, part of it was storyline, you know, from our end, right? I mean, we weren't going to do anything crazy. We were going for publicity. It was just a big publicity stunt, and we knew they were coming. So I went to Tower Records where they had Ticketmaster, and I got in line hella early and stood in line so that I could buy the front row of seats for the ECW pay-per-view and bought the front row right on camera. And we said, all right, let's, let's do this. Let's have some of our, you know, on air talent. I think Supreme chaos, Chris Kloss, Christy miss a few others, uh, homeless Jimmy. We'll just have them go have them wear XPW t-shirts in the front row. And you know, that's it. That literally was the plan. There was no plan of doing anything. Now, you know, when we got there, did we, did we maybe look around and see if there was any way to cut the transmission of the satellite truck? I can't confirm or deny that rumor, but, uh, but, um, it was okay. really, it was really just about <laughs> getting, getting, we knew that there would be a buzz enough if they were seen on television in the XPW shirts. What we didn't necessarily count on was we got there and security was all over us. I mean, I had me, I had a security guard assigned to follow me all night. Like I was going to freaking do something. Uh, and I wasn't even sitting at ringside. I was sitting up in the front row of the balcony. Uh, but apparently I was a threat, but there was people backstage. So after you yeah. stood in line, Kevin, for those front row tickets, you didn't even get well, a I, 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 the, front I row? Bought the front row of the balcony as well. And I sat there in the front row of the balcony. <laughs> I didn't want to be, I didn't need to be on camera. Uh, I didn't need to be at ringside. You, no. you, you see, okay. see, see let's, that's just say, let's just say, yeah, but that statement alone tells me that you didn't choose to sit in the front row because you were expecting yeah. something to happen. No, that's uh, you on, that, back. Uh, that was just no, gonna no, say, no, let's no, just no, 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 I w- nobody knew or gave a crap about who I was. We weren't. I wasn't on TV yet. Uh, even if I was, I don't. I mean, if I was on TV as a character, maybe it would have been different. But at that point in time, nobody knew who I was. There was no point in me taking up a seat in the front row when everybody else was on TV. But wait, hold on, you, Kevin, you you were we, a after, part of Rob Black. It was Black at that go. Though, it was right? at that Especially go. Funkers. Your- Rob wasn't even on TV. Oh, after that okay, okay. Uh, Rob didn't end up on TV until that Go Funk Yourself show that happened after Heat Wave. Um, and that's a whole separate... I mean, Rob never even wanted to be on TV. For someone that never wanted to be on TV, he became an awesome, compelling character. Um, <laughs> but it took a lot of, of, yeah. of other people pushing him to be on TV to, for him to even do it. And once the flip switched, every, it was all over. Um, but so so... We get there. Everyone's told you got to turn your shirts inside out. You know, you can't, we can't have those X-ray logos seen on TV. Okay, cool. So then the plan was just, okay, when the main event starts, everybody take off your shirt, turn them inside out. And that's that, you know, sh- show those XPW logos and let's, you know, that's it. That was the plan, full extent of the plan. 
I left the building when the main event started because I was taking the, the flyer crew, the ring crew. We were getting all the flyers, and we were going to make sure everyone that left that building who walked out the door had a flyer in their hand for our show. So I wasn't even there in the in the building when it happened. I was literally standing on the corner of Olympic and whatever the crossing is, right by the freeway off-ramp, um, with flyers in my hand, ready to ready to hit people as they walked out the door. So... What happened, as people can see on camera, is the wrestlers get up, take off their shirts, uh, go to turn them inside out, and the entire ECW locker room rushes them. Nobody from XPW crossed the barricade. Nobody touched anybody. That was all just what they said on commentary. Joey Styles says, it looks like a drunk fan, you know, tried to do... Nope, did not happen, because there are other camera angles that show that did not happen. Uh... And the ECW uh, you know, locker room cleared out. They started brawling. I'm standing there on the corner with uh, old friend, comic book artist, Tone Rodriguez. And the doors of the building blow open. And I have no, I literally no idea that this is going on inside. And suddenly, there is a brawl <laughs> between the ECW wrestlers, XPW wrestlers, ring crew. Paul Heyman is out there and slaps the Messiah. It was just like, what the F is going on? <laughs> this is insane. I'm hiding behind Tone because I don't want to get hit. I mean, I, yeah, again, I have no problem admitting that I, uh, I, I, that's not me. Um, and it was just insane. Rob's at home, you know, watching on television. No idea what's going on outside the building until we called him after and told him. And, uh, you know, the ECW guys like to say they beat up XPW when the fact of the matter is, you know, homeless Jimmy got some of his hair ripped out. And most of the people that got punched really hard in the face or knocked down were our students, our ring crew. Uh, one of the girls that was part of our ring crew and, and flyer crew got knocked down. Uh, there was no big injury to any XPW stars. Uh, but, man, it was... It, it has gone down in infamy. You know, like I said, I mean, it, for, for WWE to make a video about it then and, you know, have it go down as one of the, you know, craziest moments or whatever in wrestling history. But I'm going to be honest with you. We, I mean, that was, so we got a huge, we got a huge bad rap for that. Right. And that was, I think, you know, real, when, when, when XPW eventually went to the East coast and we were hated out there, I think a lot of it was because, you know, everybody's precious ECW had died at that point, and we were those a holes that were against ECW, and we were still alive and running. And you know, no, we never achieved that level that ECW did. But people were just like, "F this!" You know, ECW's dead, XPW's alive. We're never gonna, you know, we, we don't care what the product is. I don't care how good it is or how whatever it is. F them. That's it. Um, but I, t- I'll, I'll tell you to this very day, I stand by the fact that I think. If Paul Heyman had done the same thing at a WWE pay-per-view, people would have called it one of the greatest publicity stunts of all time. But because it was XPW, yeah. now nah, that nah, I would have stuff. to agree, yeah. So after the after the uh closure of XPW, I know a lot of things might have happened. Yeah, it was like there was like four more years, the, but yes, the heat wave incident and and the closure. Yeah. Uh, you 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 actually transitioned right to to work yeah, for so, uh, Big Vision you know, Entertainment. When I got to XPW at first, I was just like a lot of people. Right, my dream was still to go to work for WWE. That was my that was my goal. Was I'm going to do XPW? We're going to do XPW, and eventually, hopefully, right. someone will notice me, and or I can apply for a job or whatever, and I can go work for WWE. But along the the way in XPW, my my mind changed. Um, Part of it was I broke in with Ed Ferreira, who uh, went on and wrote you know, WWE and, and, and WCW. And after Ed had left, definitely after he had left WCW, probably after, yeah, I think it was after WCW too, uh, while we were there, you know, in XPW, I, I caught up with him for the first time in years. And he told me what a miserable experience it was working for WWE as a writer. Um, you know, it's the first six months, everybody loves you. You're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And after that, it's just them telling you, you don't know your ass from a hole in the ground and you know, you're crap and you're this and you're that. And so, you know, you're at Vince's beck and call 24, seven, 365. And 
that did not sound like the life that I wanted to live in the first place. And then I had a son. And it was very clear to me that I was not looking to be on the road. I was not looking to be, you know, work. I mean, we worked crazy hours at XPW. We, we was, sometimes we were working 22-hour days. Um, you know, we'd get going home, get a few hours of sleep, and come back and do it again. But that it wasn't travel, right? I was still coming home every night to my wife and my son. And so I knew that that wasn't what I wanted. And honestly, at the end of XPW, I looked at it. I think I was like 23, 24 at the time. I had written 130 episodes of TV. We had, you know, DVDs that were on the Billboard sports charts. I had done the wrestling producer, writer, booker thing at the highest level. I thought that I would probably ever do it at. And I was content in that moment to be done with wrestling. Um, and so the assets of XPW had been purchased by the company that was distributing our home videos um, because that was the only place we ever made money. We made hundreds of thousands of dollars from home video sales, but that was funding everything, the live shows, the payroll, the this and that. And we just, it, we were still constantly more money going out than it was coming in. And, but so, so Extreme Entertainment Group, XEG, who had created Backyard Wrestling and made millions of dollars off the Backyard Wrestling craze, they were looking for what else could we buy and distribute that was in that vein we could, you know, hit those Backyard Wrestling fans with. And they acquired the rights to XPW when we were still alive. And then when XPW folded, they bought everything, the, you know, the trademarks, the logos, the everything was theirs. And then XCG ended up splitting up into two companies, Big Vision Entertainment and XCG. And Big Vision, Houston Curtis, left XCG. And Houston wanted to do less extreme stuff, more mainstream stuff. You know, what what could you do that would go into Walmart as opposed to, you know, what was only going to be in, in, you know, rated R type of sections. And he was doing, like, my baby know-it-all, which is like his version of baby Einstein and poker was getting really hot at the time. And so he was doing these instructional poker videos because he's a big, big poker player. And uh, oh, yeah. uh, actually yeah. sidebar, I don't know if any of you have seen Molly's game, the movie, but one of the characters in that movie is based on Houston. And he just came out with a tell all book about the true story of Molly's game. But that's another story for another time. Um, uh, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, I had learned a lot about the home entertainment industry running that side of XPW's business. I was, you know, I was the one that was working day to day with Houston and Rick and dealing with our DVD releases and, and scheduling and all that. And Houston was uh, looking for someone to come in and be his right hand guy and build this home entertainment company with him. So I ended up going to work for Houston. And again, at the, at the, at that very moment, no, no thought to wrestling, but you know, you know how it is. Popo, I know you haven't been around it that long to have kind of come back and forth yet, but uh, you know, Gabe certainly knows. Sure. <sighs> Man, <laughs> it is hard to get it out of your system. And, and as much as you go, ah, I'm over it, oh. you know, three months later, six months later, a year later, whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you love it and you're passionate Guess about it, bug, and you've been yeah. passionate about it since you were a kid, you know, it's very hard to walk away. And so, now at Big Vision, we had this this distribution and the very first thing i did ironically and thankfully because it's the reason that there's mass republic the way it is today is i said you know nobody's ever put out lucha libre dvds in spanish in the united states and i knew that conan who had wrestled in xpw and who i'd become friends with that he had this this library of like original raw tapes of like uh, Ray and Hoovy in their first year wrestling in these bull rings or all this Tijuana footage from shows that, that Conan had promoted. And so we put together this DVD series called Desperados del Ring. And it was a series of three DVDs. Oh, yeah. And it was just all this, you know, finally unearthed, you know, footage, Conan's last, last library. And he came up to LA to shoot the wraparounds on the green screen for the DVD set. And Conan doesn't drive himself ever. He, he doesn't drive. Uh, he either takes like the train or whatever, or, or, you know, he's got someone that drives him. And at that point in time, his right hand guy was Ruben Zamora. And Ruben drove uh, Conan up to LA that day. That's the first time I ever met Ruben. And uh, we did the wraparounds and we put out the DVDs and they did, they did okay at, uh, and like Sam Goody and Ben and FYE and stuff like that. And, um, 
I met Ruben. We we had a lot of similar kind of thoughts and ideas about things, and eventually I would join him in his mass republic company. But we'll uh, we'll guess we'll get back to that that in a minute. Uh, and after that, of course, you know, now I'm like, okay, what else can we put out that's wrestling? And you know, they had the XPW library, or, or Rick had the library in Houston. Said, okay, let's let's try to start exploiting that. Let's figure out, you know, what can we do? We started repackaging like XPW seasons on television, and then. I came up with a series called Pro Wrestling's Ultimate Insiders, which was like, you know, I, I love shoot interviews. I think most people that are wrestling fans love shoot interviews. But all the shoot interviews that were out there were like two dudes in front of a shower yeah. curtain in a hotel room with like one inky light, <laughs> no production value. <laughs> like, you know, it was, I mean, that, am I right or am I right? Like, like. I mean, no production value. I was like, let's let's try to kick this to the next level, right? Let's try to take like inside the actor studio and VH1's pop up video, and let's try to do like a higher end version of a shoot interview. We got Wade Keller to host the first ones, and it was a three disc set. Everything we tried to do was three disc sets because Houston's background was um, uh, running infomercial ads for buying a video, right? Just like backyard wrestling. And the gimmick, though, was you sold them one thing, and then when they called, you upsold them another, you know, two videos if you could. So everything we did was like yeah. three, make three, three, three. So it was like one disc was uh, uh, Russo and Ferrara talking about WWE. One was talking about uh, uh, WCW. The other one was like a bunch of random stuff, including I put on this indie show called the uh, SCCW SoCal Super Show, where we brought in like a Rev Pro match, an Empire Wrestling match, a, a bunch of different uh, indie feds put on a match, which is kind of the impetus for the Viva La Lucha shows that we do now at Expo Lucha. And we had uh, Ed and Vince basically agent a match backstage, and we filmed that for, for the DVD. Uh, them kind of working, working with the talent and showing kind of what they did behind the scenes in WWE and WCW, but obviously we didn't have the footage for that. So... Uh, we we were doing that, and then we started acquiring other independent wrestling. Uh, I don't remember exactly where in the in the timeline it went, but you know we put out some Shimmer stuff into stores. We put out some uh, uh, what, what was the um, the WWN's first thing was it, uh, before Evolve um, FIP. We put out some FIP stuff. Put out some other stuff. We put out some documentaries. Yeah, yeah. Um, we did Jeremy Borash's uh, Forever Hardcore documentary that sold like a hundred thousand units on DVD. Yeah. Uh, his hardcore yeah, homecoming huge. show we put out. I mean, we sold so many DVDs. And we were doing other stuff that wasn't just wrestling. But if you went into Best Buy or any any uh, store at the time and you went to their special interest sports section, it was WWE and Big Vision Entertainment. And there were times where we had more DVDs on the shelf than WWE had. And we built this this insanely good library. And at first, it was awesome. And people were making money. And then the DVD business collapsed and stores went bankrupt, distributors went bankrupt, and it all went to oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that was that was the entry at Big Vision. Um, and then, obviously, through Big Vision, I was blessed to have the opportunity to do Wrestling Society X. Wrestling Society X. Was that so 2006? You got it aired the at the beginning of 2007. We shot the season... At the end of 2006, yeah, so we did the pilot in February of 2006. So right towards the end of 2005 is when we okay. we went in, we pitched it, and sold the concept, um, and then got the green light for the pilot and shot the pilot in February. Yep. Yeah, I mean, go ahead and talk about Wrestling Society X. How how you how how it came about. How how you built the roster. I mean, from from my perspective, Wrestling Society X is kind of like the the blueprint for shows like Lucha Underground. I mean, the the look, the feel. Well, it's the exact same um, thing. It, right, it is it's the exact, exact same thing. thing. I know a lot of people I, that. that I mean, to okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna other to one. I appreciate the. Uh, I appreciate the the praise there. Um, look, I do think it was it was the it laid the groundwork for doing something different, right? I mean, my okay, okay. So minus that, the well, parameters is the exact I, I think, same thing. Like, look, 
if any, like, I, right. I, I, I want to give credit where credit is due, right? Uh, they took, if anything, if you want to put it anyway, I would say they took the idea of underground wrestling and they did it on a cinematic level, right? Uh, they they made it a drama where ours was still. Uh, we were trying we were trying to make a punk rock wrestling show, and they were trying to make a telenovela about wrestling. Now. We could have a whole separate conversation about where Lucha Underground yeah. went wrong <laughs> because I firmly believe that had they come out swinging day one in the media and said, this is a telenovela about a, a wrestling, a Lucha Libre yeah. company, it would have been a whole different ball game for them. And they would have had a whole bunch more mainstream appreciation and coverage and viewers. But they effed up day one trying to tell Hollywood that this was a reality show. I'll let that sink in for a minute. We can get back. <laughs> well, well, yeah, but for me though, it, it was hard to believe that it was Lucha when it it turned out to be the furthest thing from Lucha. Um, obviously, Penta and Phoenix, but for the most part, it wasn't really. Yeah, I mean, Lucha. I, like, we we can like I said, we can we can have this conversation if you guys want. But I mean, look, it was it was influenced by Lucha, of course, um, and it wasn't. Look, so without giving too much away. I think, Gabe, you might be in on this little fact, but I have a concept for a Lucha Libre League, right? And someday, I still intend on having this league be a thing, <laughs> right? I still have that, oh, good. Bro. I we're still gonna, we're have gonna, that. We're going to get there down the road. Game. But here's my thing. <laughs> People came to me. People who knew this concept or what I was trying to do, or what I still plan on doing, they said to me, are you worried about lucha underground and how that might impact what you're trying to do and i said no for two reasons number one it is the polar opposite (laughs) of what i want to do with my version of lucha libre uh and i think that if anything if if lucha underground is successful it's good for me because it's just going to raise the overall awareness of lucha libre And then I get to come in and say, well, if you want to do something with Lucha Libre, here's a different take on it. But it's still going to, you know, if someone's truly a Lucha fan, they're going to like this too. On the flip side, if it fails, uh, and we can get into, I wouldn't, you know, where where it didn't work and why it didn't work. But um, if it fails, then I can still go in there and be like, yeah, that that's not the Lucha Libre that I'm trying to do, Uh, you know? And so it was, to me, it was in addition to wanting my friends to make money and be, you know, have success there. uh, I was all for Lucha Underground being a success. Uh, Obviously there are documented plenty of um, issues between um, myself or Mass Republic and, and Lucha Underground office behind the scenes for a period of time. But um, I like, personally, I like the show. I was a fan of the show. I'm a fan of anybody that's trying to do something different with pro wrestling. I think that, you know, especially post XPW, everything that I've tried to do getting back to wrestling society X is my philosophy is you are never going to out WWE WWE. And on top of that, there's already a B level, C level, D level version of WWE, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying that, or at least there's a, you know, there's a two, three, four, five version of WWE. It's called impact wrestling, ring of honor, you know, all those traditional pro wrestling companies. So whether it was wrestling society X, whether it was, you know, when I got, I, I was asked to come to urban wrestling federation and I decided, yes, I would go right for that show. You know, I've always wanted to be part of products and projects that were just different. And we're going to be able to, you know, we can take some wrestling fans. We could take some people who aren't currently wrestling fans and getting back to wrestling society X. That was, that was my goal there. You know, my, so the the whole the whole inspiration for Wrestling Society X was to make this punk rock underground pro wrestling thing because I was super into punk rock. Um, Rancid was my favorite band, and we were doing an XPW show one time at the Olympic, and the band came to hang out with Vampiro. And I've told this story before, but they show up backstage and it's like that commercial where the m M&M and see Santa. <laughs> and I was like, Holy shit. They are real. Like they were, t- they, you know, they, they are not only were they wrestling fans, but they're like, yeah, we watch XPW, you know, DVDs and stuff like on, on our bus. I'm like, 
get the F out of here. So I'm marking out because my favorite band in the world is a fan of my product. And just the more that I would hear and see this punk rock band like pro wrestling, this punk rock band like pro wrestling, I was like, there's got to be a way someday to blend pro wrestling and punk rock. And there was no intention originally to like, like this wasn't a, Hey, let's go pitch MTV. This idea. It was, I was sitting in my office at big vision one day, Houston walked by Houston was like, Oh, Hey, I got a meeting at MTV next week. I'm going to go pitch this frat house poker show. And I was like, cool. Hey, by the way, (laughs) if there's ever an opportunity to pitch (laughs) this wrestling concept, I have at MTV. I'd like to do that. Houston. I had never talked about the concept before. And he was like, what's the concept? And I was like, here, here it is. And we went to the edit bay and we took XPW footage and a warp tour DVD of all these punk rock bands playing the warp tour. And we oh, made wow. the sizzle reel for pitching what at the time was pitched to MTV as the rancid wrestling federation. It wasn't even wrestling society X. It was the idea that, you know, rancid would be the host of this show. And essentially at, at that point, there was, there were some conversations through a, through a third party friend of ours, uh, like a mutual friend of mine and a friend of the band. And there was some initial interest in doing that. So we pitched it as Rancid Wrestling. They, they greenlit it the same day, which was amazing and has completely effed up my reality of selling TV shows because never again have I ever seen, nor does that <laughs> normally happen, where you pitch a show in the same day. They're like, yep, sold, done. Um, but literally, we left the MTV offices in Santa Monica. And by the time we got back to Van Nuys, wow. we had a call basically saying, you know, we're interested in doing something here. So, but then we lost Rancid. Um, and I don't, I don't blame them for this at all, but what it came down to was the band was like, listen, in at that point, 20 years or whatever it was, we've never let anybody else control something that our name was on. And we just don't feel comfortable having MTV potentially have control of a product with our name on it. And I was like, I totally understand that, you know, it was still one of the coolest moments of my life was getting to take, uh, Tim Armstrong. And the guy, Dave, that ran uh, his merch company to Bob's Big Boy in Burbank for, for, for breakfast and coffee. Um, that was still worth it to me. And uh, I don't remember. I was probably so nervous. You know, sitting down with like one of my idols and Tim Armstrong, you know. I just remember – I remember Tim had coffee. And I do <laughs> – I remember I picked up the tab at the end and and – Tim or Dave, one of them was kind of surprised, and I and they were like, nobody ever like picks up the tab for us. Like it's usually us picking up the tab, and I'm like, dude, of course I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna pay for your coffee or meal or whatever. Like I'm 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 pitching you on something. Like it's no big deal. It's an honor. Um, yeah. I have no problem, you know, admitting my my markdom for uh, you know for people that have influenced me. Um, and uh, so Ransom pulls out. MTV almost pulled out. You know, uh, if you sell a network on a concept, especially a name of a program that they love, and then and then you tell them Don't they can't it. have it, like we <laughs> literally almost lost the deal. Um, we ended up coming up with a bunch of names. Uh, Wrestling Society X was one of them. We that was the one I really liked the best. Um, we ended up taking that back to ran. I mean, to, taking that back to MTV. They they continue with the deal, though. When we got to the pilot, they wanted to make it. At some point, they were considering making it Black Label Wrestling and making Zach Wilde the co-host of, like, the whole thing. Now, if, you, if you've seen that pilot, that was not a very good one. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, Zach Wilde was, A, very wild himself. Uh, they were shooting off guns and, like, smashing beer cans and, on their heads, like, before uh, the band was Black Label Society, before we, we shot. Uh, so that was a trip. And also just, you know, uh, nothing against Zach personally, but... He, he didn't treat it like a serious show. He was cracking jokes the whole time. You know, we put Matt Seidel and Jack Evans out there first for a reason. You know, I wanted to show people, my, like, like I was saying before, my whole hope, match, you know, I, yeah. my belief at the time was that there was a whole generation of wrestling fans who either were no longer watching wrestling or never watched wrestling. And those that never watched wrestling who were watching MTV, my philosophy was their thought of what pro wrestling was, was Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, guys that wore Speedos and were all oiled up and did, you know, leg drops and body slam. And, the, and, that, and that right there is, is true because I feel like, from my perspective, when Wrestling Society X and, and, and mm-hmm. was coming out, ECW, we were transitioning from the big man world 
to a world where we had more athletic people, more, you know, high flying and, and aerobatic and, and just just a lot of like high energy and, and wrestling society X for me, it, it gave me that. Like like the first match I saw was Jack Evans and I know. um uh, mm-hmm. uh, Matt Seidel, and then you know you had a lot of like Teddy Hart, you know, came and I mean it was just such a high impact. Show. And that was my that was it, my it, whole my whole it, hope, right? Was to I show a new generation so, of fans this is what wrestling you know either is or or can be. Yeah, and and you know I I when we look back at Wrestling yes. Society X. I, you know, one of the things I am most proud of about it is that roster and is the people that, you know, I mean, look, people who were wrestling fans knew who Jack Evans was, knew who Teddy Hart was, knew who Matt Seidel was. If you knew indie pro wrestling, if you knew Ring of Honor, if you knew, you know, if you were in it, but the average wrestling fan, the WWE fan or the laps fan or the never fan, they didn't know who those guys were. They didn't know who, you know, M Dog was. They didn't know who, you know, Tyler Black and Jimmy Jacobs were. Um yeah. And and so <laughs> no one knows who little Cholo is still. That's not nice. not nice. Oh, come on. Uh <laughs> Little Cholo was on Lucha Underground. Shout out to Two Little characters. Cholo. <laughs> People know who he is. Um so you know, yeah, so that that was my goal. So yes, he was. we went so we 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 got that deal and you know, in the end, MTV put their fingerprints all over the show, which was, you know, that, that's their prerogative. Look, they gave me, essentially, a three and a half million dollar budget to make them 10 hours of tell. I mean, not to, five Jesus. hours of television. It was insane. Now, of the lessons I learned there, I learned, so I already knew how to make a wrestling. What I learned there was how to make television. And there's a big difference, right? And, you know, we could have done that show oh, yeah. wrestling style on a much, much smaller budget. But there's a lot of things that, A, go into making a real show. I mean, you look at independent wrestling, right? Nobody's, you know, spending money on audio sweetening and, cor- and, and correction. Nobody's spending money on color correction. Nobody's spending money on subtitles and closed captions and, you know, all these things that add up. Uh, you know, when we were wrestling, when we were, when we were producing XPW or most independent wrestling TV shows, ECW included, it's one editor in the edit bay doing one show per week. And just, it's a, it's a machine. It's in and out, right? Well, MTV wanted to do this like a, you know, what they knew of was doing this like a regular television show. So we had these half hour episodes and each one had an editor that got like five weeks to edit it. Because it was this cut and that cut and these notes and those notes. And these editors got paid like $2,500 a week each. And we had like four of them. (laughs) And it all, I mean, that budget adds up. But what I also (laughs) learned in making television, and things are a little bit different these days because of how budgets have kind of gone down. But it does play into Lucha Underground a bit. The executive producers, the production company, they get 10% of the budget. If you're a big enough production company, that you know that's your standard deal. So it was in Big Vision's interest to get that budget as high as possible without getting it too high to where MTV was like, "Nope, can't do it. Not going to do the show." And you know, I mean, that was the most successful year of my life. Uh, you know, I'm hoping in the future that there's more. But um, <laughs> that was a, it was a great year, especially because even though the show on TV only lasted five weeks or whatever it was, we were in post-production on that thing for, you know, basically a year from, you know, from the, from the, um, let's see, we started, we shot the, the, we shot the season in November. And I think we worked basically from, so there was pre-production before that for a month or two. And then we went through, you know, I guess basically April or whatever. So um, it was, that was good times. And then after that, MTV had the rights for the home video, but they weren't going to do anything yeah. with it. And eventually we, we negotiated, Houston was able to negotiate the rights so that Big Vision could put out the home video. And we sold 100,000 plus units on DVD. So, Jeez. It, w- it, was, it was exciting for me because just watching the show, like just from what I remember from back in the day, 
you know, I, I thought it was something new. I was excited because, it, you know, you had guys that I had seen in like tape trading and just kind of like putting my, you know, just talking with people. Vampiro came and then Vampiro became the Wrestling Society X champion. Then here comes um, Judas uh, Macias and, and, you know, he's, you know, he becomes a champion. I'm thinking, oh, they're gonna have like this other champion. Well, tag okay, so then th- so let me let me take a uh, real quick what, what uh, happened? to touch on Papo's point. There were gonna be, I mean, there was gonna be a tag team tournament. Now I hate to stop you right there on such a cliffhanger, but I was unaware that this interview was too big for one episode. We're gonna have to bring back a part two, and that just means you're gonna have to tune in next week. So tune in next week for part two of Kevin Kleinrock. We got a lot more great discussion, a lot of good conversation, great deal of insight and experience from this man. I cannot wait for you to hear it. Before we get out of here, we got to make a couple of announcements. One, we got social medias up. You can give us a follow on Instagram, straight out of the bodega. You can give us a follow on Twitter. That's at str 8 O U T. D A B O D E G A, straight out the bodega. Yeah, I know it's not straight out of the bodega, but Twitter wasn't giving me enough characters in the ad, so we had to do what we had to do. Hey, Twitter, holler at us, man. Let's get that change day set. You can also follow us on Facebook, straight out of the bodega. We'd appreciate it if you comment, post, share, and just interact with us on all that. Also, you can subscribe, rate, and review on all your favorite podcast platforms. We are on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Podbay. The list goes on and on and on. Also, check out my social medias. Search Pop Oesco on all forms of social media. Give me a follow. Interact with me. Talk to me. I'll talk back. But that's our time. On behalf of the podcast, on behalf of Gabe Ramirez, I am your master of ceremonies, the King Fat Boy Papo Esco. This is straight out of the bodega. We are out. Lucha-masks.com by Pro Wrestling Revolution. Bringing you, in partnership with Mask Republic, the Lucha Brothers, as well as Japanese legend Ultimo Dragon. Go to lucha-masks.com and fight Lucha Strong with masks from your favorite Lucha Legends and Pro Wrestling Revolution Luchadores. Stay safe in style and represent your favorite luchador. Get yours now at lucha-masks.com, powered by Pro Wrestling Revolution.